Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Standing Committee on Justice and Human Rights. As we resume our study on online hate, we have a couple of procedural things to start with. Uh, we're going to be naming a, a conservative vice chair of the committee, and I'm going to turn it over to the clerk to be able to, uh, to do that. Mr. Clerk, uh, Mr. De Graffier, c'est à vous. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Alors, uh, je suis uh, prêt à recevoir les motions pour uh, le poste de premier vice-président du comité. So, for the first vi vice chair of the committee, I would ready to receive nominations. Lisa Raitt, are there any other nominations? That uh, the Honorable Lisa Raitt be uh, elected as first vice chair of this committee. Is the committee in agreement with this motion? Yes. Mr. Garrison? Uh, do we have an indication from Ms. Raitt that she's prepared to accept? Um, the committee my, received uh, an indication. My, my understanding is I've received, certainly received an email from her saying she's prepared to accept. Thank you very much. So is it the pleasure of the committee to adopt this motion? Yes. Oui. Yes. Oui. I declare the motion I declare the motion carried. So Ms. Raitt is uh, elected first vice chair of the committee in absentia. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I know that we want to get to the um, conservatives' witnesses in due course. I have a motion to put on the table that I'm asking colleague to send around. I'll read it into the record uh, so it can be in both languages. The document that I'm sending around is in both languages. Um, here's the motion. Whereas the treatment by Mr. Cooper of the president of the Alberta Muslim Public Affairs Council was discriminatory, hurtful, dis and dis disrespectful, and whereas reading into the record the comments from the terrorist attacker in Christchurch, New Zealand was inappropriate, be it resolved that the committee recommends that the name of the attacker in the Christchurch, New Zealand massacre, as well as any quoted portion of his manifesto, be expunged from the committee's Hansard, and that the committee report this recommendation to the House. I, okay. Just give me one second, please. I'm on here. Um, I believe this motion is receivable, and it's related to the online hate study we're doing right now, uh, since it related to a meeting that we did on online hate, so the 48-hour rule wouldn't apply. So I, I'll rule this as a receivable, and Mr. Boston, the floor is yours if you want to speak to your motion. Well, Mr. Chair, thanks very much. I think the motion speaks for itself. I think we've uh, had conversations here both in camera uh, and uh, ex-camera on this matter. Uh, it's a sensitive matter. We expect Canadians to be able to uh, come to this uh, committee uh, and be heard and uh, to not receive uh, uh, you know, the kind of treatment that um, Mr. Suri received. At the same time, we also play a role in Canada in the international community, and I think it's important that uh, this reference be expunged from our committee's record. Thank you, Mr. Boissonneau. Uh, is there anyone at Mr. Garrison? Then Mr. Broussard. Mr. Garrison, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, I certainly welcome this motion. Uh, I think what we have before us is uh, not just in order, but very important. We have seen the government of Zealand, which has tried very much to make sure that the uh, manifesto of the Christchurch shooter and his name uh, not become infamous. And so we live in an era of social media. We live in an era where things spread like wildfire. And we live in an era when sometimes people confuse free speech, which is about the rational exchange of ideas, with throwing gasoline on the fires. Uh, we've just seen this morning uh, another shooting incident in Australia and Darwin. We don't know anything about the reasons, but we certainly live in what I would call incendiary times. And so I think we have a responsibility as a committee of parliament to make sure that we do not contribute to that and that we respect the wishes of the New Zealand government in trying to make sure that those who engage in violent acts uh, based on extremist ideologies do not get a public forum to spread their ideas. Uh, and just to be clear, I'm, I'm not opposed to people having ideas or people thinking ideas. What I'm opposed to is giving a public platform for the spreading of those violent ideas and for the spreading of hatred. And I think by excising this testimony, we would contribute in, in that manner. Thank you, Mr. Thank Broussard. You. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, just for the record, uh, Leader of the Opposition has dealt with this. Mr. Cooper has apologized for his comments. Um, this is nothing more than a stunt, and I call the question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, well, I know you can't call the question, and I'm just going to avoid that, but I didn't see anybody else that had their hands up to speak. Oh, Mr. Garrison, I'm sorry. 
Uh, so I guess I would say with respect to Mr. Broussard and, and uh, Mr. Broussard and I have a, a long history of working together on things. I disagree uh, quite firmly this morning. It's not up to the Leader of the Opposition to decide when this is over. Uh, there was an attack on a witness before the committee. Uh, it's up to this committee to decide when and if things are over. Uh, while I respect the limited action which the Leader of the Opposition took, uh, this is clearly a responsibility of, of the committee itself to make decisions for itself about what the right thing is to do on this occasion. And so I would uh, not take the time to restate my remarks, but it's simply uh, the leader of the opposition's dealing with his own caucus members and who speaks for his caucus is something which he has to deal with himself. If he wishes to have Mr. Cooper to continue to be a spokesperson for him on justice, that's his decision and all the consequences that flow with that. But this is a decision which the committee must make itself. Thank you. I saw Mr. Boston's hand and Mr. Barrett's hand, and then we have witnesses, so I'm just Point Thanks out. very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, there's nothing in the motion uh, that calls for any additional uh, sanctions on Mr. Cooper. This is simply about uh, uh, doing the right thing here at the Justice Committee and uh, cleaning up the uh, record from something that's regrettable and should have never been part of our record. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Barrett. Mr. Chair, uh, opposition members have a limited amount of time to call witnesses during this study. Uh, the study has... Uh, um, been going on for some time. This is uh, our last witness panel. Uh, these are um, uh, these witnesses have, are uh, under limited time to testify. I would again ask that the chair call the question okay. so that we can so that we can uh, proceed with hearing the testimony to complete our study. So, Mr. Bear, I, I appreciate that. The chair can't just call a question as long as there's a member that wishes to speak. But I don't see any other members that wish to speak at this point. So we can actually move to the question. Uh, all, all those in. A request for a recorded vote. I'm going to turn it to the clerk then. Okay. Yay to the motion would be yes to Mr. Boissonneau's motion and nay would be against. Mr. Clerk. Merci. Merci. Monsieur uh, Boissonneau? Oui. Mr. Sassi? Yes. Uh, Mr. Fraser? Yes. Uh, Mr. Erskine Smith? Yes. And Mr. McKinnon? Yes. Mr. Barrett? Abstain. Uh, Monsieur Brassard? All abstain. And Mr. McKenzie? Mr. Garrison? Yes. So, yes, five, contre, zero. Wouldn't there be six? There's nine people here. Just I, I think uh, there's six, yeah, yes. Yes, yeah, yeah, so <laughs> six, yeah. Perfect. Okay, so the, mo the motion is adopted. Mr. Garrison? Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, not being the permanent uh, representative on this committee, I received a very low, late notice that this session was to be televised. And I guess uh, my question is that none of the previous uh, testimony by witnesses has been televised. And so uh, it seems peculiar to me that only the last uh, segment of this would actually be televised by the committee. So um, I, I guess I want to ask the chair um, why, why, that takes, why that's taking place, but, but perhaps short circuit that by sim simply saying, that I'll move at this time that this meeting not be televised any further. I'm going to not be televised. Still, yeah. I, just, I, just, yeah. I don't think it would be debatable, I mean. Oh. Okay, so, so it is a receivable motion which is non-debatable and non-amendable according to the clerk. I'm, yeah. I'm, I, on a point of order, Mr. Barrett? Yeah, I, I just, I, I guess I, I would just, for my clarification, um, what, what's the, pro my understanding is that the committee doesn't decide, uh, committee members don't decide which meetings are, uh, are televised and which are only um, uh, communicated by audio only. So uh, if we don't make the proactive decision to televise, why would we make the reactive decision at a committee to cease the uh, the broadcast? So, so I, is that I think that's a, a let's let's call that a let, let's call it a question of information. Um, I, 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 to be to be to be fair, um, I thought I thought because there was interest that I had seen in this meeting, I I suggested it be televised. But it, there's a receivable motion on the floor that is non-debatable and non-amendable um, at this point to. Uh, to not televise, so uh, point of information. Well, I, I, I was allowing it because Mr. Barrett was genuinely curious. You put forward a motion which is non-debatable, non-amendable, Mr. Mr. Garrison. I suggest we probably get should get to a vote so we, we can get to the witnesses one way or the other, if that's okay. Since it's non-debatable and non-amendable, well, with respect, Mr. Chair, you did. Uh, point just of order, from, sorry. Well, 
publication. Yeah, I just, uh, just based on Mr. Garrison's point uh, that he raised, I, I just want to make it absolutely clear that the meeting is public. Yes. And that, that, that the motion isn't to go in camera. Yes, so I, I totally broadcast. understand. Oh, in case there was any confusion, yeah. I totally understand that your motion is simply that the meeting remain completely public and simply have an audio uh, recording and not be televised. Yes, I think that's, that's understood. Not so, so again, this is a non-debatable, non-amendable motion. Um, we, will go to the, we will go to a vote. Is there anyone that wants a recorded vote? Mr. Garrison wishes a recorded vote. I'm going to turn it again to the clerk, Monsieur de Crefier. Monsieur Boissonneau? Agreed. Uh, Mr. Sassi? Agreed. Uh, Mr. Fraser? Yes. Mr. Schkensmith? Uh, I'm here on Icker's behalf, so yes. Uh, Mr. McKinnon? Yes. Mr. Barrett? Yeah. Uh, Monsieur Brassard? Oui. Mr. McKenzie? Yes. And Mr. Garrison? Yes. So in favor of 10, uh, again, zero. So favor 10, so uh, we will not televise this, uh, the rest of this meeting. And I will suspend for one minute, and we will move to an audio recording, and then we will hopefully start with the witnesses. Today, um, as individuals, we have Ms. Lindsay Shepard, welcome. Mr. John Robson, welcome. And Mr. Mark Stein, welcome. Um, each of the witnesses uh, will speak in turn. Uh, Ms. Shepard, you're on the list first. Uh, we're going to go in the order of the agenda. The floor is yours, ma'am. Honorable members, thank you for the invitation to appear today. Earlier this year, I received a seven-day suspension from the social media website Twitter for violating their rules against hateful conduct. According to the Twitter rules, you may not promote violence against threaten or harass other people on the basis of race, ethnicity, national origin, sexual orientation, gender, gender identity, religious affiliation, age, disability, or serious disease. So what was my tweet that supposedly promoted violence, threatened, or harassed someone? Well, my tweet referenced an individual that I cannot name here today due to a publication ban in this country. This individual can only be referred to as JY. JY is an individual that has taken 14 female estheticians to the BC Human Rights Tribunal because they declined to perform waxing services on his male genitalia. There are also screenshots of Facebook messages between JY and others, where it appears he makes very predatory comments about wanting to help 10 to 12 year old girls with their tampons in bathroom stalls. In the tweet that got me suspended, I referred to JY as a guy who creeps on young girls and vulnerable wo working women in the Vancouver area. And I posted some of the Facebook messages he has written about his plans to approach young girls in the female washrooms. Why was it deemed hateful conduct for me to write this tweet? Because JY purports to be a male to female transgender person. And so by alerting t people to his troubling conduct, I got kicked off Twitter for seven days because what I wrote was seen as a transgression against his gender identity. Prominent Canadian feminist Megan Murphy was permanently banned from Twitter for misgendering the same individual, JY, that I have just spoken about, and for tweeting, men aren't women, though. These tweets also fell under Twitter's hateful conduct policy. Murphy is now suing Twitter because as a journalist, her livelihood is largely dependent on her online presence. And she is being denied an online presence and being denied the ability to participate in the public square as online spaces are today's public square. I am concerned about the potential return of legislation such as Section 13 of the Canadian Human Rights Act because what that legislation does is punish Canadians who, in exercising their right to peaceful free expression, might offend a member of a protected, marginalized group. If someone with a marginalized identity experiences commentary they find offensive, they can claim the offense is an attack on their identity rather than being legitimate expression. Human rights tribunals become the tools by which those who speak their mind peacefully and nonviolently are silenced. Many other witnesses before this committee have discussed the need for a definition of hate, and many call for a need to draw the line between free speech and hate speech. As a graduate student at Wilfrid Laurier University in 2017 and 2018, I woke up to how my peers and academic superiors understand hate. 
When the word got out that I had played an excerpt from TV Ontario's The Agenda with Steve Pakin in the classroom that I was a teaching assistant for, an excerpt that featured psychologist Dr. Jordan Peterson discussing Bill C-16, compelled speech and gender pronouns, a PhD student at my university said at a rally that I had played hate speech in the classroom and had violated the spirit of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Likewise, a professor at George Brown College named Dr. Griffin Epstein asserted in a letter to the Toronto Star that I had played, quote, hate speech in the classroom, end quote. And these are just two examples. Recently, Facebook has taken to banning white nationalists from their platform. If you poke around online, tons of people call me a white nationalist and a white supremacist because I have offered criticisms of the practice of Indigenous land acknowledgements and have cited the statistically backed up fact that white Canadians are becoming a minority in Canada. An instructor at Wilfrid Laurier University, Dr. Christopher Stewart Taylor, used class time in his anthropology class to tell his students that I have neo-Nazi, white supremacist ideologies, which he followed by saying, I shouldn't have said that, forget I said anything. So I don't have a Facebook account, but if I did, would they ban me? How many people does it take to smear you as a white nationalist or white supremacist before you get banned from certain online spaces? This committee has noted that underlying their study on online hate is a finding by Statistics Canada that reported a 47% increase in police reported hate crimes between 2016 and 2017. However, this increase is principally from nonviolent crimes. As the T Statistics Canada website reads, police reported hate crime in Canada rose sharply in 2017, up 47% over the previous year and largely the result of an increase in hate-related property crimes, such as graffiti and vandalism. Now, perhaps you caught this story in the news recently. A couple of months ago at Laurentian University in Sudbury, a student found some candy arranged in the shape of a swastika on a cafeteria table. This swastika-shaped candy arrangement is being investigated as an incident of hatred and intimidation by the university. However, I do not think that one single isolated incident of candy arranged in a swastika is enough evidence to indicate that anyone is trying to incite hatred, target, or intimidate. This is an example of how the bar for what constitutes hate is too low. I have had so many encounters with the hypersensitivity around what constitutes hate that I know bringing back Section 13 of the Canadian Human Rights Act would be a mistake. It would, cost too, it would cast too wide of a net, and extremists who are already intent on causing real-world violence will go to the deeper and darker web to communicate, while, whilst in, individuals who shouldn't be caught up in online hate legislation will inevitably get caught up in it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Shepard. Uh, we will now go to Mr. Robson. Mr. Robson, the floor is yours. Well, again, thank you very much to the members in the committee for an invitation to speak to the Standing Committee on Justice and Human Rights. And I'm here to speak in defense of the very fundamental human right of free speech. I know that all the members here are extremely concerned about hate and intolerance. And I know that you're horrified by the eruption of bad manners and loathsome opinions on the Internet. Too often, social media seem to encourage our worst passions. But despite that, and it is a real problem, censorship is not the answer. Now, I know censorship is an ugly word, and it may well not sound to you like what you're considering doing, in part because your motives are good. But censorship is the right word for what happens when government restricts freedom of speech for any but the narrowest of purposes. And censorship is an ugly word because censorship is an ugly thing. There are legitimate grounds for government to restrict freedom of speech. Because the state exists to protect us from force and fraud, it's rightly illegal to conspire to commit crimes. It's illegal to libel or slander people. It's illegal to incite violence, and it's illegal to engage in material misrepresentation. But when government seeks to limit or prevent any communication that does anything else, including insulting or denigrating people or groups, it's censorship. 
And the problem with censorship is that it cuts the rattle off the snake. It doesn't drain the venom from the fangs. And I want to be very clear here that a lot of the opinions that hate speech laws target are not just factually wrong, they're loathsome. It, the, my argument here isn't that neo-Nazis are fine people who happen to be misunderstood by idiots and the hypersensitive. My argument is that in the battle of ideas, truth will prevail. And that when you limit the battle of ideas, you put truth in peril. I don't need to tell you why censorship and tyrannies is bad. They're trying to repress the truth. And I don't need to tell you that if you go online, you'll find yourselves called tyrants and Nazis and all sorts of stupid and moronic insults. But the response to this kind of thing is to rebut it, to refute it, to laugh at it, to shun it. It's not to call a cop. And so what I want to do here, I want to bring up the three arguments that John Stuart Mill made in On Liberty back in 1859 against censorship of unpopular ideas. And it's important to be clear, it is censorship of unpopular ideas that we're talking about. There was very little occasion for elected governments to try and censor popular ideas. But what Mill said is, first and most fundamentally, an idea that people don't want to hear, an idea that is unfamiliar and upsetting, might turn out to be true. I know you're not worrying about that when it comes to online hate, and there's no reason why you would be. But we have to protect freedom of speech because we might be wrong. We've been surprised before, and we don't have the wisdom to know in advance what ideas we shouldn't silence because we'll eventually realize they were right, and which ideas we can safely trample underfoot because we know they're wrong. But of course, there are ideas that we would stake our souls, if we have souls, on being wrong. Not just being erroneous, but being vicious. I don't know because um, there are certain things you don't want in the record of the committee, but I'm going to say it out loud. Here are some ideas that are so wrong that you might be tempted to say no one can say them. Hitler should have finished the job. Blacks are inferior. That kind of stuff. There is no possibility that we are going to realize one day, oh yeah, that was true, we shouldn't have been so blind to it. But this brings me to the second of Mill's arguments in favor of free speech, it's the Dracula effect. Of course, he didn't call it that because Bram Stoker hadn't written his book yet. But it's the principle that sunlight destroys evil. That the way we get at truth is to speak out against error, denounce it, and refute it. The open societies are a gigantic gamble that truth has nothing to fear in a contest of ideas. And the trouble with censoring hateful speech is that you drive it underground, where it isn't exposed to sunlight, where it isn't refuted, where it isn't ridiculed, where it isn't shamed, and where people are not shown the error of their ways, because we want to rescue the haters as well as protect society from hate. If you keep it off the open internet, it goes into the dark web. It, fos it festers and it breeds in dank basements. So it even lets haters wrap themselves in the, martyr, uh, in the mantle of martyrdom. You don't want to do that in the name of truth. And the third point that Mill makes is that if you live in a society where the conventional wisdom is not challenged, even things that are true tend to be accepted as kind of stale dogma, not as living truths. But when you hear correct ideas defended, when you defend them yourself, they become vital and living parts of your life. They become something that you act on, something that informs your existence and makes it better. Now, censorship doesn't really work. It didn't even really work in tyrannies. I mean, Censorship in the Soviet Union allowed communism to last longer and in the end to collapse more disastrously. But it also didn't work in Weimar Germany. Weimar Germany had laws against anti-Semitism and they didn't stop Hitler. What do people say in retrospect? They say we should have listened to what Hitler was saying. I meant to bring a copy of Mein Kampf as a prop. I'm afraid I got busy this morning and forgot it. But it belongs on every educated person's bookshelf. Because we need to know what hate looks like. We need to know how it could once have prevailed. So we know how to fight it in others and in ourselves. 
And I once assigned it as university text. I thought it would make a great headline, you know, right-wing professor assigns Hitler text. I don't, don't even think the kids read it because it was so long. But the one thing I wasn't worried about is that they'd read it and become Nazis. And you should not worry that if Canadians are exposed to hateful speech online, it will turn them into haters. It'll do the opposite. It will anger them. It will lead them to speak out against it. It will lead them to think more completely and thoroughly about tolerance and to be more tolerant people. There are a lot more things I could say, but I'm not going to steal my fellow witnesses' time. But I want to quote Queen Elizabeth I. At a time when religious differences threaten bloody civil war, she said, I have no desire to make windows into men's souls. That the state can prohibit acts of violence is very clear, and it's an essential duty. That the state can prohibit incitement to violence. If someone stands on a street corner and says, kill that capitalist, they're going to get arrested and they should get arrested. But if someone stands on a street corner and says the only solution to the ills of capitalism is violent proletarian revolution, they should not be arrested. Because we don't need censorship to protect us from force and fraud. And we certainly don't need it to protect us from truth or error. We are adults. In the free societies from the time of Galileo and Socrates, our heroes are those who challenge conventional wisdom, shock reputable opinion, outrage their neighbors, and question authority. Most of them turn out to be cranks and they're forgotten, but some of them turn out to have been right. And when you try to silence opinions you don't want to hear, we pay a huge price in truths we don't hear, and we drive untruths underground, and in doing so we strengthen them, we do not weaken them. Free speech lets us discover unexpected truths. It lets us refute error. It lets us live in the truth of our beliefs. It's a vitally important human right, and I implore this committee to uphold it in all its messy glory. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Mr. Stein, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very uh, much, uh, Monsieur le Président, and also to the uh, honorable members of the committee. I am uh, honored uh, to be here. Um, I would, I would just like to say a quick word on the, uh, as much as I always enjoy seeing Miss Rate, uh, uh, about the defenestration of Mr. Cooper from this committee, which I understand is the business of the members of the committee. Uh, but I, I am concerned, I was driving into Ottawa listening to my old friend Evan Solomon on the radio, who was arguing that, in fact, uh, it was perhaps time for Mr. Cooper to be booted from caucus. Uh, that is actually the age we live in, where people can have one uh, infraction and their life implodes, their career implodes, they're vaporized for it. Uh, and that is actually one of the most disturbing trends on the free speech issue. The surviving vice chair of this committee uh, said uh, recently that Jordan Peterson should not be permitted to testify to this committee. Bernie Farber, uh, just I believe just last night, said Lindsay Shepard should be booted from appearing before this committee. Uh, Ms. Shepard and uh, Mr. Peterson are law-abiding Canadian citizens, and this practice of labelling people uh, and demanding that they be uh, instantly deplatformed, booted from uh, polite society is in fact more serious uh, than some of the other matters before this committee. I was here last time round, 10 years ago, when we got rid of Section 13, because it was corrupt uh, in absolutely every aspect of its operation, uh, from minor bureaucrats uh, indulging strange James Bond fantasies and playing undercover dress-up Nazis on the internet, to pathetic rubber stamp jurists who gave Section 13 a 100% conviction rate uh, that uh, even respectable chaps like Kim Jong-un and Saddam Hussein would have thought was perfectly ridiculous. The worst aspect of it was secret trials. Secret trials in Ottawa, not in Tehran or Pyongyang, but in Ottawa. I discovered it one evening before dinner, and I emailed my friends at McLean's and um, the eminent barrister Julian Porter, whom I see uh, the Prime Minister recently retained as his QC. That's how respectable he is. And Julian, in a couple of hours, wrote a motion 
uh, referencing uh, Viscount Haldane and Ambard versus Attorney General of Trinidad and Tobago, real law, not the pseudo law of Section 13, and did what John did. He, uh, Julian's motion, opened up that dank, uh, fetid dungeon of pseudo justice to the public, to the people of Canada. And after 20 minutes in the cleansing sunlight that John talked about, uh, the unimpressive jurist in that case, Athan Athanios Hadges, uh, decided that Section 13 was unconstitutional and he wasn't going to have anything more to do with it. Sunshine works. The most important aspect, while we're quoting judges, uh, John Moulton, uh, 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 wrote a famous essay a century ago on uh, the realm of manners. And he said the measure of, of a society is not what one is forbidden to do, which is to murder and steal and rape, and not what one is compelled to do, such as pay the taxes or join the army or whatever, but you measure a society by the space in between, the realm of manners, where free people regulate themselves. Canadians do not bash gays uh, or lynch minorities because they are enjoined by the state not to do so. They do so because they are operating in Lord Moulton's realm of manners uh, where free people, civilised people, regulate themselves. And that is where the internal contradictions of a fractious, multicultural society uh, should be uh, played out. The idea of bureaucrats once again getting into this business uh, is, is deeply disturbing. They didn't have enough work last time. They had to actually, uh, shortly before the McLean's case, which was the one I was involved in, uh, the senior counsel of the Canadian Human Rights Commission actually went to Toronto to speak to various groups to say they weren't getting enough cases and that's why uh, people should file more complaints. Ultimately, free speech is hate speech and hate speech is free speech. It's for the speech you hate, the speech you revile. The alternative to free speech is approved speech and that necessarily means approved by whom? Well, approved uh, by yourself as a citizen, if you don't want to have Lindsay Shepherd over to dinner, as Bernie Farber doesn't, that's fair enough. But once it becomes speech approved by the state and speech uh, approved by formal bodies, it effectively means the speech approved by the powerful. The biggest threat to free speech at the moment is a malign alliance between governments and big tech doing the kind of things Lindsay spoke of. The photograph that sums it up is the one of Mr Trudeau with uh, Mrs May and Miss Ardern and uh, President Macron in Paris the other day, sitting opposite across the table from the heads of Facebook, Twitter, Google uh, and uh, Apple. Uh, six woke billionaires who presume to uh, regulate the opinions of all seven billion people on this planet. That is far more of a threat than some pimply 17-year-old neo-Nazi tweeting in his mother's basement somewhere out on the prairies. And that issue, that is the real threat to genuine liberty uh, in our society. I cannot believe that a mere 10 years on we are talking about restoring this law. It was appalling and unfortunately this committee and the House never actually confronted it in reality. But I will finally, I will finally say this on a personal note. I was born in Canada. I love Canada. I would die for Canada. I am old-fashioned enough to take the allegiance of citizenship seriously. But no monarch, no parliament, no government, and certainly no bureaucratic agency operating the pseudo-law of Section 13 can claim jurisdiction over my right to think freely, uh, to read freely, to speak freely, and to argue freely. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much to all the witnesses. We're now going to go to questions. We're going to start with Mr. Barrett. 
Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Shepard, Mr. Stein, Mr. Robson, thanks for uh, your testimony um, this morning. Uh, Mr. Robson, on the uh, 16th of May, you wrote uh, an article, or an article was published that you wrote, and it said, uh, I quote, I think it's very important to take a stand that what's dangerous isn't paintings, it's people who kill in response to paintings, books, cartoons, or a sideways glance, close quote. Can you expand um, on the context of what should be done or not done in response to uh, online hate? What should be done in response to online hate is that we should, first and foremost, not put it out ourselves, which might seem like a very trite point, but I noticed that last night there was a tweet from a professor of uh, political science for whom I thought I had some respect, uh, which had a clip of a political leader speaking about the fact that we're all God's children, and he said, keep your imaginary beep out of my public policy. And I thought to myself, how have we come to a place where somebody like that would not be ashamed, I mean, just to utter obscenities in public, can we please stop doing that? But in the second place, to dismiss Christianity as a word I'm not going to say into the record. And this seems to me to... in incite hate and ridicule for Christians, at least in its intention, but what it does is expose the perpetrator as contemptible. So first of all, we don't tweet things like that. Secondly, we react to them with contempt. We can unfollow these people. We can answer them as I did in what I hope was courteous language, but very firm on the substance. And I would, if invited to debate a Nazi, I would not be afraid to do so. If invited to debate a racist, I would not be afraid to do so. But what you don't do is silence by force the expression of odious opinions. And I was thinking, actually, to do with this thing about New Zealand and the manifesto, which apparently is unfit for consumption by parliamentarians, although, as with Mein Kampf or, say, Stalin's Foundations of Leninism, you need to know about this stuff because it's dangerous. In the middle of the 20th century, John Starn was one of the most eminent magicians in the United States. And during World War II, he went around teaching American GIs how to cheat at poker. And someone said, this is the strangest thing. What are the, why are you teaching the GIs to cheat? And Skarn said, because the bad guys already know all this stuff. And I want the guy who wants to play an honest game of poker to recognize when somebody is doing something with a deck that they shouldn't be. And again, if you think you can keep the name of that shooter or his ideas out of the dark web, you are deluded as to your powers. What we need to do when we confront, encounter online hate is answer it indignantly, but as I say, in such a way, if possible, as to redeem the hater themselves. Because as Andrew Shear said, we are all children of God. But if you can't redeem the hater, you can at least protect others by showing what's wrong with these ideas. And that's what we do. We don't drive them underground. We don't drive them into the places where the Nazi party spread its message despite laws against anti-Semitism in Weimar Germany. We do not have the wisdom, do not arrogate to yourselves the power to silence speech because you don't have the wisdom to know what needs to be silenced. None of us should have that power and it doesn't help. It simply gives hate a hiding place where conditions are propitious for it to breed and swarm out. Thank you uh, for your response, Mr. Robson. Uh, Mr. Stein, one of uh, the ideas that's been raised by the committee and uh, by the Prime Minister is, uh, as you mentioned, the reinstatement of Section 13 of the Canadian Human Rights Act. So you had, um, as you as you mentioned, uh, involvement in litigating this section um, and its subsequent repeal. Could you expand on your experience in that regard to Section 13 and um, the utility of legislation like that? Well, as I said, the problem with Section 13 is that Canadians aren't very hateful people, so there was a lack of real serious complaint. Uh, one man had his name on every uh, complaint since 2002. A man called uh, Richard Warman was the plaintiff on every Section 13 complaint since 2002. As a, it's a bit like Groundhog Day for me, uh, this, but I'll, uh, I'll, I'll proceed anyway. Uh, as, as I mentioned last time round, uh, some of you may know that uh, there was a self-appointed witch finder general in England 
some centuries back, and uh, for whatever it was, uh, two pounds, uh, he'd go out and find witches. Richard Warman was the hate finder general of Canada from 2002. One plaintiff on every single complaint. Uh, these, these, the, the offending material was seen by nobody. Um, one, uh, one post that the Canadian Human Rights Commission spent years investigating under Section 13 had been viewed by 0.8 of a Canadian, or if you include uh, territories, uh, 0.6713 of a Canadian, something like that. Uh, and most of those 0.6713s of a Canadian were undercover agents of the, uh, of the Human Rights Commission whiling away their time at taxpayer expense uh, on, uh, on, on uh, groups like Stormfront. In other words, Dean Stesey and Richard Warman of the Canadian Human Rights Commission joined neo-Nazi groups. There weren't enough neo-Nazis in Canada. So we had servants of the crown pretending to be neo-Nazis, which is preposterous. They were aided by Sergeant Camp, uh, for example, of the Edmonton Police, who was also a member of Stormfront. So if you are one of the three neo-Nazis in Canada and you go online of an afternoon thinking you'll meet like-minded neo-Nazis, you'll find that the only people on Stormfront are Dean Stesey of the CHRC uh, trying to entrap Richard Warman of the CHRC, trying to uh, entrap Sergeant Camp of the Edmonton Police. It was a corrupt and indefensible racket, and I have heard nothing from the witnesses before this committee uh, that would suggest we are any more capable today of preventing those abuses. Thank you very much. Mr. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mr. Fraser. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be uh, sharing my time with Mr. Erskine Smith. Ms. Shepard, I, I just want to discuss with you a couple of things that um, you mentioned in your presentation and also um, some activities that you've undertaken. Uh, one thing that I, I think is missing sometimes when we talk about free speech, it sometimes gets confused with consequence free speech, meaning that uh, people have to be responsible for what they do say. And, and I take it, um, I, I agree obviously with the point that uh, free speech in Canada is, is a protected right, that it obviously is extremely important and, and that we cherish it. Uh, but that it is subject to reasonable limits um, in, in our charter. Consequence-free speech um, is something that has to be borne in mind when uh, responsible individuals are engaging in civil society. I want to talk for a minute about a recent YouTube interview that you did with Mr. Gary Pay. Um, and I'm sorry if I'm pronounce in pronouncing that incorrectly. I'm not familiar with him. But the topic of population replacement came on. And I know you talked a bit in your presentation about whites becoming a minority. Now, this YouTube channel hosts, uh, hosts white supremacists quite often, neo-Nazis uh, like Richard Spencer, former KKK Grand Wizard David Duke has appeared on that program, and you appeared on it recently talking about population replacement. After you finished that statement, Mr. Gary Pay then uh, started talking about white genocide and how that when whites are in the minority, like in South Africa and in Haiti, the white genocide occurs. And you, you, you said nothing in rebuttal to that. I mean, do, don't you think that free speech comes with a responsibility, especially when you're confronted with inflammatory and insightful rhetoric? Um, I don't think I'm here to defend my personal track record. In fact, at a previous hearing, um, Nassim Mithuani, one of the witnesses, was asked about her personal activities, and it deemed that that wasn't appropriate. So, so I, you're I'm not, not going to answer defend the question. My, my personal activities. Because what we're here to talk about today is online hate. This was a uh, video interview that was online on a YouTube channel known for espousing white supremacist, white nationalist views that you appeared on just last month. So are you not willing to comment on whether or not you believe that that interview constituted online hate in a, in a, in a study on it online hatred? It did not hatred? constitute online hate, it was not hate speech. Did you, have you uh, spoken to any member of parliament before today about your appearance here at this committee? No. Okay, I'll give my time to Mr. Erskine. Sir. 
Uh, thanks very much, uh, Eid Mubarak, everyone. There are thousands of uh, peaceful, uh, loving, and welcoming Muslims in my riding right now. Uh, I'm normally in D'Antonio Park with them. Um, I'm here with you instead. And so, Mr. Stein, uh, in, in light of Mr. Robson's comments about sunlight and having a more civil back and forth about uh, comments rather than uh, ensuring uh, the, the stiff penalty of the criminal law, you've previously said about moderate Muslims. Uh, that they uh, want stoning for adultery to be introduced in Liverpool, but they're moderates because they can't be bothered flying a plane into a skyscraper to get it. Um, do you regret anything that you've said about Muslims? Well, I'm a great believer in, in first principles, sir. Um, and the, que the question is, clearly thing things that are said uh, uh, in the course of public discourse are offensive, uh, obnoxious, are hurtful. The question before this panel is, should they be criminalized? No, no, but my question to you is, do you regret anything you've said about Muslims? I regret many things I've said on many subjects over the years. I will say, here, here's, but here's the difference. Nassim Mithuwani, who I like a lot, I've, I've run into Nassim every couple of years, and I like her enormously. I like Muniz, I quite like Kurram Awan, who was the third of those Muslims who uh, uh, attempted to criminalize my writing. But I think there is a difference in this. I'm willing to debate you. I'm willing to debate Nassim. Uh, I'm not willing to go along with the big shut up. Then, which then is I, I appreciate you say that because we, we talk about thresholds and, and Mr. Robson was uh, raising great concern about uh, any threshold to hate speech. We, of course, for decades, since 1970, have had a very high threshold with respect to hate speech in the criminal code. So to all three panelists, give me one example over the last 50 years where the criminal code has been improperly applied to hate speech. One single example, 50 years. Why, what do you mean by improperly? Has it been... So uh, a court has dismissed it and said that this should never have been brought. You, you raise procedural concerns about Section 13, mm. you, you, you lambasted it for your 10 minutes. Give me one example of impropriety with respect to the criminal code and hate speech over the last 50 well, years. Well, I've read the Taylor and Watcott decisions carefully, and nothing that people have complained about before this committee come anything close to the uh, narrow definitions of the Supreme Court of Canada in right, both Right, the narrow definitions cases. of the Supreme Court of Canada. Yes. So we're t my, my concern is an enforcement issue. I think it should be the high threshold of the criminal code. None of you have, have suggested a single example over the last 50 years as to why that high threshold is a problem. So my concern is enforcement. And I, I encourage you to, to take that back and think, are there better ways we can enforce criminal hate speech? And the last thing I will say, because uh, it's not just uh, uh, the end of Ramadan this week, uh, but it's also this Thursday, the 75th anniversary of D-Day. And Ms. Shepard, when you go on uh, YouTube and, and you, you embrace the views of population replacement with a white nationalist, just remember who the Nazis are. Thanks very much. Ms. Shepard, do you want to respond at all to that? No. Okay. Mr. Garrison. May, may I respond? Uh, well, thank you very much. Well, I appreciate it. That was a per I, I asked Ms. Shepard. He, he made a statement. I asked her because she was referenced in the statement. I, I, I'm you sure you'll have a question to all the witnesses. Oh, on the criminal code? Yeah. And, and although I am not here to debate specifics, I want to say that in as much as laws that censor speech are fundamentally illegitimate, it is not appropriate to figure out what the best way is to do a bad thing. On the other hand, and I, because I talked earlier about how the internet is awash in rubbish, I run a website which actually is skeptical about man-made climate change. And people are forever saying, we're going to report you as fake news and get you shut down. But the other day, somebody put a comment on our blog that said, and I quote, Canada's environment minister, Catherine McKenna, a.k.a. Climate Barbie, in typical Nazi-like screeching manner declared, blah, blah, blah. And then at the end, it said Joseph Goebbels would be proud. And of course, I deleted that comment as soon as I saw it. Because as a private matter, not a governmental matter, we are under no obligation to tolerate this kind of rubbish when it appears. And I have reproached people for using that nickname for our environment minister. I think it is disrespectful. I think it is mean-spirited. I think it is harmful to speaker and to audience alike. A man is not poisoned by what goes in his mouth, by what comes out of it. But as a private matter, we refuse to associate with these kinds of things. As a public matter, it is not your place to silence us, even if we want to say something like, the Koran does not separate church and state, and this is a serious problem in political economy. Thank you very much. Mr. Garrison. 
Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. And, and I must confess, I find this panel extremely challenging because I happen to live in the real world and I happen to live in this century. And so when we have members on the panel talking about and saying things like uh, there is no gay bashing in this country, that's simply not true. Uh, and uh, when we say that um, hate crimes, are, for the most part, aren't violent, uh, unless you look at the case of transgender Canadians when most of the hate crimes that are reported are violent. So uh, we've had a lot of, I think, factually incorrect material. But I think for me, uh, the, the question comes down to the minimizing of the impacts of hate speech. And so I'm going to talk very personally here as someone who has been the first uh, out gay man in a lot of different positions. And I don't think any of you three understand how, what the result of the hate speech is uh, for people in my position or for uh, transgender people, for uh, Indigenous women in Canada. I don't think you understand at all what happens in the real world. So when I was appointed to the police board some time ago, we had to have a discussion with the police chief about whether I had to have more police protection, right? Because there were people online, at that time it was early, but online, who were inciting violence against me uh, as, as an out gay man. Uh, when I was elected to city council uh, in a very progressive community, we had to have discussions about what would happen at the public meetings because of things that were being said and posted about the fact that I, some, someone, my favorite, someone should do something about me. Uh, I, I took that uh, very seriously, and certainly my partner took that very seriously. And when I was elected to Parliament, I received death threats, multiple death threats. Uh, and I had to meet with the police chief and have a discussion about what was an appropriate response uh, to those to those threats. Some were very explicit, some were less explicit. Uh, and, and my conversation with the police chief was, if, if I'm a member of parliament and somebody who's been an out public figure by that time uh, for almost two decades, and this is being directed at me, what is being directed at other members of my community? What are they facing on a daily basis? Uh, and if we don't do something about that, uh, then uh, we are in fact encouraging it to go on. And so the, the police chief that I worked with, very progressive, uh, saying, surely you're not talking about arrests. And I said, of course I'm not talking about arrests. But I'm talking about some door knocking with those who have directly threatened me, saying that this behavior is unacceptable and it needs to stop. And uh, there, was, uh, there were a number of cases where the, the police did agree to do that. And in my case, I was not worried on a daily basis that any of those particular individuals which we'd identified would come after me, although it was possible. I was, as I said, worried about the impact of that kind of speech and that kind of behavior on other members of my community. Uh, I would have to say that for me, uh, when I first arrived in Parliament, there was an official statement done by a party, which I won't name today, uh, suggesting that I was a friend of pedophiles. Now, you might say that's free speech. Uh, my argument with the speaker was that that impaired my ability to do my job as a member of parliament. So by identifying me with a quite reviled and justly so group in society, people were affecting my ability to act as a member of parliament. Unfortunately, the speaker at that time never ruled uh, uh, on that question. And I would have to say that um, perhaps that was a statement by an outlier because uh, that didn't happen again in, in parliament. But it was necessary for me to speak up at that point to prevent the continuation of that kind of speech. So when you, and all three of you have done this, when you minimize the impact of hate speech on people's daily lives, I think you miss the entire point of these hearings. The entire point of these hearings is not about criminalizing speech. It's about f deciding where in a modern society where social media have, in fact, become the public square, where do we draw the line? And so the old cliche, we all know that uh, there are limits on speech. You can't shout fire in a crowded theater. So the problem is defining where that crowded theater is these days. And quite often that crowded theater is online and is the internet. And so what this committee uh, is trying to do in these hearings is figure out where to draw that line. What's the appropriate place? It's not trying to ban speech or ideas. And I would have to say, uh, because one of you uh, did say it, uh, that we need to debate these ideas so we know what's wrong with them. And I would submit we already know what's wrong with racism. We already know what's wrong with homophobia. 
We already know what's wrong with misogyny. What we're trying to do is to make sure that those ideas have less impact on real lives of people in our society. And so uh, I guess I reject almost everything that you said today because the context you place it in is academic, is historical, is, and has no relation at all to what happens in the real world. And so I, I believe, Mr. Chair, that uh, we're out of time as a committee, so I will uh, leave my comments there. Um, well, there was no he didn't ask any questions, Mr. Stein, uh, and that's a member's prerogative to just make a statement and not ask questions. Uh, Mr. Sassi is next. Mr. Sassi. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Now, if I could uh, start off with uh, Ms. Uh, Shepard. Um, Ms. Shepard, um, on March 22nd, you were published in uh, Maclean's. Um, there is a quote attributed to you. Uh, and it re and I, I suspect you had said, appearing on a neo-Nazi podcast and reciting slogans associated with Nazism is distasteful, destructive to healthy race relations, and completely deserving of harsh criticism. Do you still stand by that? Absolutely. Yeah, that was March 22nd, 2018. Okay. Uh, would you agree that racism can be destructive to healthy race relations and deserves to be criticized and condemned? Sure. And you would say the same thing about sexism and homophobia. They're destructive to the public order and they should be condemned? Well, then I have to go into how are you defining those things. But as a general, just as the question as it is, yes. Yes. So you agree that all of these isms can, can, can be troubling to the public order? Sure. And should be condemned? Sure. Okay, so do you think that public figures, Canadian public figures, have a responsibility to condemn hate speech? No. No, you think it's perfectly fine. So you agree it's destructive, but you don't think it should be condemned? I don't think people have a responsibility to condemn. You don't think people have a responsibility to condemn? But no. I think you said here they are deserving of harsh criticism. That doesn't mean people have to be assigned a responsibility. No, but, but you do agree that these terrible things are deserving of harsh criticism. Sure. So why do you think that our uh, public figures should be spared? Um, I guess I just don't want to go into a situation where it's you have to speak out on every single little thing that happened, and if you're silent, you things, are a big culprit. Things. Do you think the big things they should criticize? Well, then we have to go into how what's the difference between a little thing and a big thing, sure. and see how the these things, things go you in would circles, agree, right? Uh, with the notion that they should be condemned. Sorry. But the big things, as you put it, you think should be condemned. Yes, but then the problem is the operational definitions. Okay, thank you for that. Now, um, uh, Mr. Stein, um, I think you essentially admitted to the fact that uh, you have said obnoxious and hurtful things in the past. Uh, would you stipulate it? I've been in this business a long time, uh, and I don't think you'd find anyone, including most of my editors, who would uh, find me anything other than obnoxious, unpleasant, and hurtful. Okay, so uh, would you agree that uh, the article you wrote in McLean's The Future Belongs to Islam, uh, where, it's, where you stated it's the end of the world as we've known it. Would you, would you agree that's alarmist, that's obnoxious? Well, well, actually, that's a bit of the problem. With it. This is what the, and with respect to Mr. Garrison thinking this is all academic and mumbo-jumbo, that's what the uh, my learned friends would call res judicata. The thing has been adjudicated. I was taken no, to but three... Would you say that that's obnoxious I was, no, and, and No, I was taken to three I, human I rights is, tribunals say, and I won, sir. Alarming. I won. If you want to take me to I've court for a, a fourth question, time, very I won. Question. No, that's been Why adjudicated not? and I'm in the clear. I beat the rap. Uh, on, uh, in British Columbia at the Federal uh, Commission I don't think you were adjudicated as to whether you were obnoxious or you were hurtful. No, as I said, it's so stipulated, sir. No, but that's uh, not what you were adjudicating. That is correct. That is, Would you agree with that? Well, that my that obnoxious. That I sat in. I sat in the Robson Street courthouse in Vancouver yep. and heard an expert witness flown in from Philadelphia discourse on the quality of my jokes, some of which are indeed obnoxious, <laughs> hurtful. I think that sure. is better left Thank to for an article in the Literary Review sure. of Canada, Absolutely. sir. Now, uh, you also objected to uh, Chris Cuomo, uh, the CNN uh, commentator, saying. The real problem is white supremacists in America. They're the real monsters. You took issue with that. Why did you take issue with that statement? Well, actually, I'm not sure I have any uh, particular 
Well, here's the thing. I'm not... I, my QC in that case, Julian Porter, also the Prime Minister's QC, he took Could the position... stick to Mr Cuomo's... I'm, t- I'm, st- I'm answering your question. He took the principal position that we had nothing to defend under Canadian law. I am not here, sir, to justify to you words I have used on TV in the United States, radio in Australia. And I do not intend to do it. The words I chose are the words I chose. And you are free to interpret them as you so wish. Why did you condemn No, you're you're doing what is the most, perhaps the most repugnant aspect of this. No, you're you're doing what is the most repulsive aspect of this committee, which is you're trying to force people to deny certain things they said five, 10, 15 years I'm ago. I'm asking questions, as if that's there, my job. Here. As if there is only one correct position on no, Islam, I'm, I'm on immigration, on climate change, on transgender bathrooms, on same-sex marriage. We cannot keep going on saying this is the correct line, and if you don't, I, I, and you're not Mr. willing to Stein, sign on I'd to I'd that, you're to a hater. I say that I completely agree with Mr. Garrison. Well, this isn't an abstract exercise. I'm just asking you simple Well, questions. I'll tell you something uh, with respect to that, too. I'm not going to bandy death threats with Mr. Garrison. I take it he's had them. Uh, I appeared on stage uh, at the Danish Parliament. Uh, had to be protected by Danish uh, secret police, security service, the secret service. Uh, the British Foreign Office and the United States Department of State said it was not safe for British nationals or U.S. citizens to go near that event. When I appeared there five years before, in the fight, I was on Mr. stage Stein, with I four. I, I was on stage with questions. four other people. One of whom had her restaurant firebombed. The other of whom had her Could had this event shut Mr. up. Stein? No, I'm, I'm, tell- I'm, I'm telling. I'm telling you. Guys. that there are all kinds of people who get death threats. And if the alternative is surrendering our liberty no, over death threats, suggesting. to hell with that, sir. Thank, thank uh, you, thank you. Time, the time has uh, elapsed. I, I want to thank all of our witnesses today. One of the important parts of discourse is that we try to do so reasonably, even if we strongly disagree, and hopefully we continue to do that. I, I really appreciate very much all of you being here today.